Spoiler Feast Theater, a podcast that doesn't give a shit about spoilers. We just want to talk about the movies. My name is Megan Kearns. My pronouns are she, her. I write film reviews for Edge Media Network. I'm a member of the Boston Online Film Critics Association, and I'm a member of Gallica, the Society of LGBTQ Entertainment Critics. My name is Evan Crean. My pronouns are he, him. I'm co-chair of the Boston Online Film Critics Association and co-author of your 80s movie guide to better living. Yes, you are, sir. And people, you should get that book. It's good. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) thanks. You're welcome. I have it. I've read it. (laughs) (laughs) And you may notice, and if you've already listened to the Patreon episode, if you're a patron, um, you may notice that Dave is off this week. So it's just the two of us. Just the two of us. The two of us. Building castles in the sky. So Dave, we miss you. And that musical interlude, that was terrible, but that was for you. So, because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we like a musical interlude around here. And Dave, it's usually Dave who is championing them and leading the brigade for those. Yeah. So, yeah. And speaking of patron, Patreon, if you're not a patron, consider joining because we have a lot of wacky and fun conversations over on our Patreon. This week, we fulfilled a patron's request and we talked about the 1982 fantasy Conan the Barbarian with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Mm -hmm. And we had a good time chatting about that strange movie. (laughs) Yes, we did. (laughs) Yeah. So go to, and if you are a patron, thank you and go check it out. And we also want to give a shout out to our sponsor piece patron, Heather Sachs. Thank you so much, Heather, for your support. And yeah, thanks, Heather. Yeah. So this week, we've got two movies. We've got a big one. Going to talk about Barbie. And we're Ooh. also going to be talking about... Yeah! <laughs> and I'm actually... I'm Well, I'm bummed whenever Dave's not here. But I'm really bummed because Dave and I both saw it. So I'm bummed that he's not here to share his views on it. But we're going to be talking about that. And we're also going to be talking about theater camp. So let's kick things off with Barbie, the event of the summer and Mm -hmm. my most anticipated film of the year. (laughs) That is not an exaggeration. I was very excited (laughs) and I am very excited to talk about it. So Barbie is directed by Greta Gerwig. It is written by Greta Gerwig and Noah Baumbach. And it stars Margot Margot Robbie and Ryan Gosling and a whole bunch of other people. But they are the two stars. But there's a whole ton of a supporting cast. And let me give you the the synopsis. (laughs) I find it humorous. This is so this is from the press release. Um, To live in Barbie land is to be a perfect being in a perfect place unless you have a full on existential crisis or you're a Ken. And that's it. (laughs) (laughs) That's it. That is it. It's all you're getting. Now, I did not watch any of the trailers. I never watch trailers, or I should say it's a rarity for me to watch trailers. So I have not, I did not watch the trailers for this. I did not read anything about this other than the fact that they ran out of pink paint in the production design because there's so many shades of pink on the set. (laughs) And that was really all I knew. And I have to say, I don't normally give this disclaimer. I think I can count on one hand the times I've given this disclaimer. I think I've done it for two films, one of which was Parasite. The other one I'm not, I don't remember, but I know I've done it for another film too. This is a film that I think the less you know going in, the better. So I'm not going to say don't listen to this episode (laughs) in advance, but you (laughs) may not want to. You may want to come back after you've seen it. Um, Having said that, I do still think that even if you do know the entire plot, everything, I think it still would be enjoyable. I just think it would be enjoyable in a different way. Um, But yeah, but we're, this is spoiler piece. We're going to spoil the shit out of it. So, so buckle up and be prepared. So let's tear off the (laughs) bandaid. We're ripping it off. Rip, rip. Yeah. So If you have seen the trailers, then you know how the movie opens. The movie opens with the scene of Barbie landing, a giant Barbie landing, and it's a complete, uh, complete homage to Stanley Kubrick's 2001. And like with the music, little girls smashing their baby dolls, like the apes, like in the presence of the monolith. (laughs) It's great. And it's, and it, you know, and the narrator is Helen Mirren and she's talking about how before Barbie, dolls were baby dolls. And it's interesting seeing this and kind of 
forgetting the importance of that because when I was a kid, I despised baby dolls. I'm like, I don't want a baby. They're not fun. Well, I don't want to play with a baby mm-hmm. doll. But Barbies, Barbies were my jam. Barbies were the shit. I loved Barbie because Barbies had careers and friends mm-hmm. and extensive wardrobes and a house and cool pink kitchen and cars and all this stuff. So, I mean, it's a capitalist dream, of course, but yeah, but Barbie was cool. So it, I think it's interesting that the, the film kind of kicks off that way and showing like what a kind of seismic shift the arrival of Barbie as a toy was. And mm-hmm. yeah, so then the, then the movie goes on and you see Margot Robbie, who is the quote stereotypical Barbie, because there are tons of Barbies. There's like Dr. Barbie and, you know, Mermaid Barbie and President Astronaut. Barbie. What? President Barbie. President Barbie. Yes. Played by Issa Rae. Um, there's neurosurgeon Barbie. There's astronaut Barbie. Like there's so many Barbies. And they talk about like all the various Barbies and they all live together in Barbie land. And every day Barbie wakes up. And when I say Barbie, I'm going to talk like Margot Robbie, Bobby. Margot Robbie Barbie wakes up and she wakes up in her dream house and she's surrounded by her friends and their dream houses and they all wave to each other and they're all like, hi, Barbie. Hi, Barbie. And she has like a perfect day where she showers and has breakfast and gets dressed in a beautiful pink, perfect pink outfit. And every day is the same. And she goes to the beach and all the Kens are there. And Ryan Gosling, Ken, is he only has a good day if she looks at him. (laughs) Like he lives for her (laughs) attention and she basically like could take him or leave him. She's like, hi, whatever. And she's like, you know, going about her business and yeah. And then every night it ends the same way with a, you know, disco dance party, choreographed dances and it's great. And then it ends with a slumber party, a girl slumber party. Mm -hmm. And this is how it is day in and day out. And every day is perfect and everything is perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Until Barbie has a moment where she's dancing and I've seen this in GIFs um, and or GIFs, depending on how you pronounce it. I pronounce it GIFs. Yes, I know that's wrong. I don't care. And yeah, where I've seen this where she's like, do you guys ever think about dying? And then everything screeches to a halt and everyone looks at her like she's a weirdo. And then she's like, mm. I mean, I'm dying to dance more. And then everybody's like, woohoo! And the party continues. <laughs> but she does start having these existential you know, she has an existential crisis. She has these existential thoughts like, what about death? What does life mean? And and that causes a chain reaction where instead of a nice shower, and by the way, when I say shower, there is no water that actually comes out, but apparently she can feel the water because <laughs> the water is always perfect. But then when it comes out the next day, it's cold and like her toast is burnt and her milk is soured and she notices cellulite on her body. And like, so on mm-hmm. her feet, which are like perfectly arched. And there's that scene that, you know, where yes, that is actually Margot Robbie's foot. She took did that shot in like eight takes that was not CGI. Yeah. Then she can't do that anymore. And then her feet are flat. So she's very concerned that things are unraveling. So she goes to weird Barbie, quote unquote, played by Kate McKinnon. (laughs) (laughs) Great choice. It's perfect. Perfect choice. And she has like crazy makeup and her hair is all like choppy. And that's Mm -hmm. because that's what happens when, when, kids play with a Barbie too hard. They turn weird. And so it's interesting, this notion that people in the outside world playing impact the way the doll's bodies are and the way they feel and stuff like that. And then she gives, yeah. And so basically after she goes to talk to Weird Barbie, she realizes she has to go on this quest where she has to go into the real world and find the girl who, or I was going to say, it is a, She's looking for a girl, but not necessarily a girl. But in this case, it is a girl mm. who is playing with her and has she has to help her in her life if she ever wants to get back to the way she was. And yeah, and then she goes on like this odyssey into the real world and Ken follows. She does not want him to, but he does. He stows away in the backseat of the car. <laughs> and of course he does. Of course he does with his rollerblades. <laughs> <laughs> and that rollerblading down Santa Monica. Um, but yeah, and that's basically it. And then she meets she meets um, America Ferreira who works at Mattel and she's a mom and she has a, da- a teen daughter and her teen daughter, like when Margot Robbie shows up, when she finally finds the daughter, she's like, I'm here, I'm Barbie. And the Barbies all think in Barbie land that the Barbies saved the planet that basically like (laughs) everything is a feminist utopia and like all Mm -hmm. the women are equal and everybody will love them and embrace them and hug them. 
And this girl, this teen girl and her friends like hate Barbies and they're all like, you know, you're what's wrong with society and, you know, perfect standards of, you know, beauty standards and, you know, being thin and like all of and, and capitalism and kind of all of these things. Yeah. So then Barbie's sad. And and then meanwhile, Ken is having his own existential crisis where he learns about what real men are and he thinks it involves horses <laughs> and Rocky <laughs> movies. And then he learns. So he's he thinks the world is great because women or he thinks that everybody looks up to him just because he's a dude. And and Barbie realizes, oh, women have it shitty because they're not equal and she feels uncomfortable Mm -hmm. walking around that she's like ogled and she doesn't feel safe. So they go back eventually and like there's this whole thing where she goes to Mattel and Will Ferrell's the president and they just want her to get back in the box because this is like a whole thing and the FBI is involved. And But eventually she goes back to Barbie land and, and Ken had went there first. And when she arrives, all the Barbies are brainwashed and Ken has basically turned it into a men's rights like utopia for toxic masculinity and all the women are catering to the Kens. And then there's like this whole plan and the America Ferrer and her daughter go with Barbie. And there's this whole plan to like undo all that and to turn things back to the way they were. And it's like, I, as I'm (laughs) like, as I'm recalling this plot, it's kind of wacky. It's out there. Um, It's very, very meta and there's a lot a lot of pop culture references like so many like they talk about for instance they talk about Alan who is a doll that was Ken's friend or buddy as it were mm-hmm. and they've talked about how Alan's have escaped into the real world before and Alan's are like all the sync members are Alan's <laughs> <laughs> and like there's funny things like there's 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 a lot of allusions to a lot of movies and it's very clear, obviously that Greta Gerwig is a huge uh, cinephile because there's so many references to other movies in this movie. But what I, I laughed a lot. This is a hilarious film. I, and I don't always laugh out loud at comedies and this very much is a comedy. It's a fantasy comedy and there are musical numbers, which I adore and like there's kind of a, like this Ken dream sequence, like dance. It's great. Mm-hmm. But what really surprised me was, and I was going to say, it's also very much a scathing condemnation of patriarchy and sexism and kind of all of the contradictions that women have to exist with. Like you can't be, you can't be too mean. You can't be too nice and be a pushover. You can't be too, you know, you have to be thin, but you can't be too thin. And like mm-hmm. kind of all the policing that society does of women's bodies and women's behavior. And that's all great. That's all very overt and obvious, but it's great. But to me, where the film really shines is in how it shows what do you do when you have kind of a catastrophic event in your life? Like, what do you do after that? You can't go back to the way things were. So how do you move through that? How do you move forward? And how do you find your purpose in life? And this this story really is a movie of self, like it's a story of self-discovery. It really is about Barbie finding out who she is and what she wants and how there are no real neat answers and things are messy and complicated. And I cried a lot in this and, and I was not expecting that at all. And I found this to be a really beautiful film in a way that I found extremely surprising. So it's really funny. It's incredibly whimsical. The cinematography by Rodrigo Prieto is just gorgeous. The production design, um, by Sarah Greenwood, and I can't remember the other woman's name. Um, the production design is just stunning. Like, it's absolutely exquisite. So it's real eye candy, which is just a delight. It's just absolutely a delight. But then there's also these real thought-provoking things happening about gender roles and about feminism and femininity and masculinity and how do you balance – how do you balance – the enjoyment of something that also could be contributing to problematic things. And I think the film treads that water really well and like balances that line really well. And yeah, the, just the whole notion of self-discovery and finding yourself. I just, I adored this. I could go on and on and on gushing about it. I, I love Greta Gerwig. I absolutely adore her adaptation of little women. I love Lady Bird. 
I think she was the perfect choice of filmmakers for this. And I also love Margot Robbie. I love Margot Robbie and absolutely everything she's in. Even if I don't love the movie that she's in, like I didn't love Babylon, she's great in it. And I think she's exceptional here. I really adored this in a way I was not expecting. It sounds really good. (laughs) It sounds like a really good movie. Um, And it sounds like it really does a good job of balancing serious commentary with comedy and achieving, you know, a, a movie that looks good and is fun visually with weaving that in effectively with social commentary and mm-hmm. good performances and good art direction. Um, sounds, sounds awesome. <laughs> you, <laughs> you definitely spoiler piece me into wanting to see it. Oh, yay. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I loved it. I just loved it. I think it's great. Yeah. I mean, could it have gone deeper in some areas? Yeah, of course. Like I, cause I, I think about this too and I'm like, you know, you see a lot of Barbies that are of various sizes, which is great. And you, mm-hmm. and, um, Harry Neff is in it and she's a trans woman and she's in it and you see, and she's playing a Barbie and you see a Barbie in a wheelchair. Like, so, you know, you see a lot of Barbies of different races and that's great. What I will say though, is that having a film that's really delving into patriarchy and feminism, it doesn't really look at how it doesn't look at intersectionality. Like it doesn't look at how race or class or disability or queerness really impact women differently um, Mm -hmm. as far as oppression goes. And I, I wish it did, but at the same time, I am still really glad that it, you know, broaches the topics of feminism that it is broaching. And I think that that's important. And also as a side note, there are a lot of interesting little queer touches here and there, like a shoe choice, like a kind of a matrix style shoe choice between a high heel and a Birkenstock, which is a stereotypical lesbian shoe. (laughs) And, (laughs) and Barbie, when she's leaving Barbie land is singing, she's belting at the top of her lungs to indigo girls is closer to fine a queer duo, like an iconic queer musical duo. So it's interesting that there's like these little queer touches here and there, even while not. And, and Barbie doesn't want, you know, she doesn't really want a relationship with Ken, even though they are kind of boyfriend and girlfriend, because that's what they're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, so it's kind of like, she's turning away from that. So it's, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's interesting. It's very interesting what it, what it, tackles what it delves into what it has to say um yeah i find this a really thought-provoking film it looks like it's got a stacked cast i'm just like scrolling through imdb and seeing who's in it Let's oh yeah Liu and michael Sarah. Mm-hmm. you said kate mckinnon america ferrera uh and i see the emerald fennel is in this movie yes not for long. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Issa Rae, Rhea Perlman's in this. She plays uh, Ruth she Handler, the inventor of Barbie, right? That is. Yes. Yes. She is the inventor of Barbie and she is in the movie. Yes. Sweet. Mm-hmm. And Rhea Perlman's always great. So it's nice to see. And she's, yeah. There's one scene in particular. I mean, she's in a few scenes, like a couple of scenes, but there's one scene in particular that's just a really... Like just thinking about it is kind of getting me emotional because it's also playing uh-huh. like what's also playing is Billie Eilish's song, What Was I Made For, which I think is just a stunning, gorgeous song. And it's just this really beautiful moment. Anyway, I've spoiled a lot, but I don't want to spoil everything. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then we Aqua's Barbie Girl is definitely not in this movie, correct? Yes and no. So huh. it is in the movie, but it's redone with Nicki Minaj and Ice Spice. I see. Okay. Yes. So a cover adaptation. Yes. yes. Remix. I don't know what's. <laughs> yes. So you still get to hear Barbie. I'm a Barbie girl in a Barbie world, <laughs> which I was very excited for. Yes. Yeah. Sweet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah, no, the, the cast is absolutely incredible. Like, Emma Mackey's also in it. And I think it's funny that she's in it because Margot Robbie wanted her in the movie because the two of them look so much alike. (laughs) 
<laughs> so she's like, you should be in this. And I think that's interesting. Um, one of the women who's in polite society, she's in this, like, and she's great. So yeah, there's a lot of like, the, uh, one of the women from Bridgerton is in it. Like, there's a lot of like, blink and you'll miss them moments. Um, some of the people are in it much longer, like Issa Rae is in it much more. Um, not a lot, but she's still in it like much more. Um, Emma Mackey's in it more. Um, yeah. But yeah. But it's great. I loved it. Nice. Looking mm -hmm. forward to seeing it. Yes. I think everybody should see it. <laughs> well, let's talk about theater camp. Yes. Let's talk about theater camp. <laughs> so theater camp is directed by Nick Lieberman and Molly Gordon, who also stars in it. And it's written mm -hmm. by Molly Gordon as well, and Nick Lieberman and Ben Platt and Noah Galvin. And the latter two also star in it. And here is the synopsis from the studio. Tony Award winner Ben Platt and Molly Gor Gordon star in the original comedy Theater Camp as Amos and Rebecca Diane, lifelong best friends and drama instructors at a rundown camp in upstate New York. When clueless tech bro Troy arrives to run the property into the ground, Amos, Rebecca Diane, and production manager Glenn band together with the staff and students staging a masterpiece to keep their beloved summer camp afloat. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's that is that's a pretty succinct summary. Um, the mm -hmm. only things I would add to it really are it's it's a mockumentary. Yep. Um, so it starts off where it is a documentary about the founder of the camp played by Amy Sedaris. Yes. And then as she's watching a school production of Bye Bye Birdie, there <laughs> is a strobe light that causes her to have a seizure and go into a coma. And yep. so hence why her son, Troy, takes over to run the camp. Yep. And... The camp is also like she's always fundraising for the camp. She always needs to get more money for this camp. So and the camp is on the verge of foreclosure. So Troy makes a lot of decisions, a lot of bad ones and brings in new people, fires other people. And yeah, so that's basically it's basically it. It's a lot of montages of the students practicing and singing and dancing and practicing for the play and auditions and things like that. And then there's also a side mm -hmm. story where um, Molly Gordon's character has kind of been disappearing and she's supposed to be working on the finale number with Ben Platt, but she's been disappearing. And later we find out why, and it's because she booked a job and he's salty about that and mm -hmm. because she didn't tell him. And yeah, so it's a lot of that. There's like some side stories like about how Glenn, the – the production manager, like he does a lot of the behind the scenes things like the lights and all the tech and, but he's never really in the spotlight and Troy encourages him to be in the spotlight. And then there's another student, there's a student who is, it's his first time at summer camp and he, at the theater camp and he really likes it, but he also likes sports and he doesn't feel like he fits in. Um, so yeah, so it's a lot about that and it's a lot about how the theater camp is like a safe haven for a lot of the kids who are, you know, quirky and maybe weird by conventional standards mm -hmm. and how they have a community. And yeah. So Evan, what did you think? I really enjoyed this movie. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. It was um, in, in good ways for me. This was kind of like Spinal Tap meets Wet Hot American Summer. It just kind of like a silly mockumentary, you know, kind of take off of musicals, musical theater and summer camp in a way that I found really enjoyable. I think the editing was really good and pr fairly well paced. Although I think my, my one, one of my issues is the movie kind of stalls out toward the middle uh, when it's focusing on the, the conflict between Amos and um, Rebecca Diane and their friendship kind of starting to fray. That's when I feel like the movie kind of loses it a little bit, but the editing I thought was really well done. The score was very kind of uh, fast paced and, and pop like popping with energy, which I think went a long way. And 
you know, I think anyone who's done theater before and musical theater can appreciate the way that this kind of lampoons the theater and like people who are obsessed with theater and theater camp itself. I did not go to sleep away theater camp, but I did go to theater camp. So I can definitely. (laughs) That's amazing. Yeah, I can definitely appreciate some of those. I, I mean, I mean, it was like kids, like it was more for kids than some of the older kids like in this so there was a little less of the like prima donna y kind of stuff going on, but it, <laughs> still, you can. It, I I really had a lot of fun with this. I was enjoying it. I think there were a lot of great supporting performances. I think the the key, the core group I really liked the Molly Gordon, Ben Platt, uh, Noah Galvin. I thought they were all pretty good. I think. I've seen Molly Gordon in a few things and it it was funny how much she was able to transform herself into this kind of like hippie (laughs) seance like kind of character (laughs) because I've seen her play more kind of like straight laced characters. Um, So it was funny seeing her play like a more outlandish out there kind of person. And I thought she was really good. And I was just, I was impressed that it was like, she was directing this, writing this, the fact that the core group also wrote the the songs to this, I found really mm-hmm. impressive. I, it was just kind of knocked me a mass in that way. Like, wow, I didn't realize that these people were so multi-talented. Like, I know Ben Platt has kind of had his theater thing going on, but like, I've seen him in movies and been relatively unimpressed by him. <laughs> <laughs> Ditto. And so I was like, oh, he's actually pretty good in this too. I mean, like, you know, not mind blowing, but I, I really liked Molly Gordon and Noah Galvin. I think more uh, their performances. And I like Jimmy T- uh, Tatro who played Troy. I think he did a really good job playing this kind of bro kind of clueless guy who's stumbling his way through running this camp who probably should not have the keys or any really <laughs> any kind of control uh, of this camp. So it was fun watching. It was also fun watching this guy who's like a bro who would normally be kind of commanding in a room, have, you know, a room full of theater kids who pay him no mind, like that (laughs) part where he's trying to get everyone's attention (laughs) and and no one cares what's going on or is listening or paying attention until Ben Platt gets up there and somehow is able to command the attention of the room. So I, yeah, I had fun. I, I liked the scene after that where Molly Gordon and Ben Platt were, acting out as they were announcing the different shows that they were going to be doing. They turned their announcement about the musicals they were doing into a musical. And I thought the musical that they came up with, which was called still Joan, which was, (laughs) or Joan still, I can't remember um, about Joan, Amy Sedaris, the theater camps founder. I thought it was actually really good musical and the production was very impressive. (laughs) The final number was really good. It's a good song. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was. It, it somehow all worked out, even though it seemed like she was making it up on the fly earlier. <laughs> Molly Gordon was. Yes. Well, she goes and she goes back and finishes the song. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. So that's why I don't know when she did that, but <laughs> supposedly that's what happened. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it all came together. What about you? What did you think of this movie? So I thought this was. So this has been very this this has been very very hyped since Sundance. It, people adored it at Sundance. It got sold very quickly out of Sundance and I have been hearing about this film for months. So it, it's been hyped to me left and right and when I saw it I'm like, "Oh, this is cute." And I think it's okay. I'm not as enamored with it as a lot of other people are. I get why I get why you like it. I get why a lot of people like it. But for me, it's there are things I like about it, but I mm-hmm. think I appreciate it more than I actually enjoyed it. Like I I agree with you. The score is great. I love the zippy, peppy score. Really mm-hmm. fantastic. And there is this kind of kinetic and frenetic energy to the editing and to what's happening on screen that I appreciated. And Mm. I liked that. I think Noah Galvin is really great. He's really, really great. Yeah. And I agree with you that I think, wait, what's Troy's name? What's the actor who plays Troy's name again? Uh, Jimmy Cotter. What is his name? 
It's Jimmy Tatro, I think. Tatro, that's it. Jimmy Tatro. I he was actually my favorite. I thought he was great. Like I thought he was mm-hmm. really fun. And I didn't actually find this movie that funny, but I thought he was really funny in a way I was not expecting because I've seen him in other things and he hasn't really left an imprint on me. And like he's always been okay, but I think he's really good in this. And I do think it's interesting that this is based on their short film and they it was so successful, like they put it online and it was so successful that they decided to expand it and make it a feature length film. And I read a couple interviews with Molly Gordon and Ben Platt and they said that like 90 or 95 percent of this is improvised, which like they had an outline for a script, but basically they just kind of let the kids and the adult actors kind of just run with it, which you know, is interesting and can yield a lot of comedic moments, a lot of great things. For me, Mm -hmm. it just didn't quite come together as much as maybe I would have liked it to have. Um, And I don't know, maybe that's because I've never, I've liked other camp movies, but maybe because I've never been to camp. I've never been to theater camp. I've never been to summer camp. I've never been to camp of any kind. Um, Maybe that's why, I don't know. But I will say that I did really appreciate these theater kids. Although, again, and maybe because I was too young, but like I did theater as a kid, like I did school plays and stuff like that. But nobody, it's funny that you were saying like nobody was like a prima donna, but like, yeah, nobody was mm-hmm. like a prima donna. Um, yeah. So I'm kind of like, I wish I could have seen older theater kids because like maybe this would resonate more because I very much get the sense that this is authentic. And they did say that this was their experience because they went like the the opening film shots that you see are of them at summer camp. Like, and I, I noticed, I was like, that's got to be Ben Plagg because that looks like him. And it is. Right. And it is Molly Gordon. And they've been friends since they were kids. They're best friends in real life. Ben Platt and Noah Galvin are engaged. Um so they're in a you know relationship in real life. And mm-hmm. yeah, so it's very clear that they're all very intertwined and their lives are connected. And, and there's this authenticity to that, which I really, really appreciate. But again, for me, it's more like I appreciate the things about this film than really enjoyed it. And I think because nobody felt like a real character to me, everybody just felt, it just felt like zippy, quippy lines and, you know, kind of weird hippie moments and Mm -hmm. you know and it just kind of felt like more like skits to me um except maybe for jimmy tadro's character who does kind of have this emotional arc where he really learns to appreciate his mother's life work and he learns to appreciate theater and yeah so there there's a lot to like here and i think i'm and i don't dislike it i think this is a good film it just didn't really resonate with me, I think, the way that it does with other people. And mm-hmm. I think I'm going to be in the minority, which is totally fine. I I hope people love this. I hope they adore it. Um, but yeah. yeah, that was my experience. I hope, so. I hope hope they like it too. It's uh, I thought it was very funny. I laughed a lot. I think I probably laughed a lot more at the title cards than I did at the dialogue per se. <laughs> I think the, ti- the title cards the title were cards quite were funny. Especially when we find out at the end that... There's this guy who's been staying at the camp as an Airbnb guest that, you know, <laughs> Troy rented out to him uh, to try and make money. And then that guy turned out to be super rich and he ends up saving the camp. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is one title card and it is towards the end. It's not that one, although that one's a good one. But there is one that ma- did make me laugh out loud. And I was like, "Ooh, that's a good title card. I wish I could remember now what it was, but I don't. But yeah, yeah, the title cards were good. They were yeah, they were funny. And then also I really enjoyed Susie Essman's cameo when we find out that this show was being like broadcast to the hospital room that we think that Amy Sedaris is in. And then it turns out Susie Essman has been sitting there watching it. She's like, I don't know any people, but this is amazing. I really enjoyed this performance. Like it's wonderful. Bravo. And Joan sounds like a great woman. <laughs> yeah. It turns out she's in the next bed over. She just yes. didn't see any of it. <laughs> No, but I love when she wakes up and she's like, don't let Troy run the camp. <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't do the worst job, although he did almost lose the camp. <laughs> he did almost lose it to Patty Harrison and the evil I know. camp next door. I was excited to see Patty Harrison because she's always so great. I think she's underutilized in this. I would agree. 
I would agree with that. Yeah. And then there was there was a cameo. Will Ferrell did a voice where he was talking on the phone. He was the guy from the bank calling about past due money. I thought that was oh. pretty funny that Troy was so hapless that he had to look up repossession. He had to read the <laughs> the, 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 the like the definition of repossession. <laughs> that may, I didn't catch that, but that makes sense since Will Ferrell's a producer on the film. So yeah, that mm-hmm. does make sense. <laughs> yeah, and I also liked Troy's money making scheme to put on a fancy dinner for Carl from Succession oh and those people, <laughs> and he tells the kids that they're part of some performance piece they're dressed as like yes. servers and he does and then they're out there doing weird performance pieces while serving these people dinner <laughs> that i think is the best scene that was amazing yeah well doesn't doesn't some little girl come up to them and is like i lost my son in vietnam or something like that and you're just like what yes. yeah because then later he's like that was very triggering <laughs> <laughs> He's like, and you have children selling, uh, serving alcohol, and I don't think that's legal. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Oh, Carl, Carl from Succession. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know what? Uh, what other scene? I was dying laughing when they were doing their vocal exercises to warm up, and they're like, Al Gore just came from the old cheese store with his bags he got from the ocean floor. Wolf Blitzer has a blister on his upper lip. I was dying laughing during that scene. <laughs> <laughs> wolf oh wolf blitzer i'm just trying to think if there's anything else i i really enjoy this movie i'm glad that uh got a chance to to see it and i think it's on hulu it's playing in theaters but also is available on hulu right Mm-mm. no not yet mm. nope just in theaters yeah what did you think of um ioa de berry's performance uh, she was the liar yeah i was gonna say i I know everybody talks about her in The Bear, and I haven't seen The Bear, mm-hmm. unfortunately. But I did like that she showed up as a uh, a con artist. <laughs> Someone who was there who didn't know anything about theater, lied on her resume. And uh, that was pretty funny, just seeing her like <laughs> kind of fumble her way through. Especially when it got to the part where she was supposed to teach the kids stage combat. And then she's like, oh, how would you define stage combat? And she's getting these like esoteric answers. Like, how would you give me a dictionary definition? <laughs> yeah, a non-poetic one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I thought she was she was good. I, I mean, I thought this was a pretty solid cast overall. I, I can't think of anybody that I disliked in the group. I think the kids were quite good. Yes. Yeah, the kids were were all really good and funny, too. Yes. And I think, yeah, and child performances are always like, it's always a risk. It's always a gamble. And they were really good. Yeah. Yeah. I, I forget the kid's name, but the, the kid who was, you mentioned he was the kind of like athletic one who was there and but mm-hmm. still interested in theater. I was dying laughing during that part where he was like, and I've come here and I've, you know, been able to live my uh, truth as a heterosexual male. And his gay dads are like, we always knew. We're so proud of you. And they're like <laughs> crying in the audience. <laughs> Do you have any other any other parts or moments you want to talk about? No, I, I think we hit it. Oh, you know what? There is one other thing. I See, I knew it. So in addition to it feeling kind of long and kind of stalling out in the middle, <clears throat> like losing steam. I wish they didn't really have this conflict between Amos and Rebecca Diane. It felt very shoehorned into the movie and forced this idea that like, oh, you know, they're he's upset that she's moving on to other projects and this whole backstory of like they went to audition for Juilliard and he screwed up his audition and she got a call back but decided not to go. And so they've all just they've been kind of in this stasis since then. Mm-hmm. I just didn't feel like the movie needed it. I, I think the movie, there's enough conflict of them trying to hold on to the camp because the camp is in financial ruin and there's this idiot at the helm who's running it into the ground with his wacky ideas that it just felt forced and unnecessary to have it be a a conflict between these two people who were already best friends. It just It felt entirely unnecessary to me. I completely agree with you. And 
that's why I had I had some problems with with the editing, and that is a prime example mm. of why I had a problem with like I wish it had been tighter editing because. Yeah, I mean, like I feel a little torn because I complained earlier that I didn't really feel like any of the characters were real characters, but this to me doesn't flesh them out either. It's just, it feels like a forced conflict, like you were saying, and there is enough conflict. Mm -hmm. Do we really need this? This doesn't really illuminate anything about their characters. You know, it just, it just provides another obstacle and it, yeah, it doesn't really it, it completely felt forced to me too and I felt it was very it was very unnecessary. I do mm-hmm. wonder if they put that in because it like they experienced something like that in real life because early on in the film, like when we're getting backstory on the two of them, there's this part about how when they were at theater camp in the summer as kids, uh, she had a crush on him, but he came out as gay and then they moved on. And apparently, like they said in interviews, like that was really real, like that actually happened. And so I'm wondering if like that's why they put that in there, that part about Juilliard, mm-hmm. um, because maybe – but I agree with you. It feels forced. It's it's unnecessary and I think they should have excised it. I think they should have excised that subplot and focused more on making – the characters actually feel like characters and not stereotypes, at least for me. Yeah. I think the movie would have benefited from that. I mean, Mm -hmm. we've seen the trope a million times of, Oh, this thing's in financial ruin and we need to save it. And that's fine with me (laughs) like that. I don't, I don't really care about that being kind of like a rote thing that happens. It's there. There's always a satisfaction, I think, to watching people kind of band together and come up with creative solutions to kind of figure their way out of financial turmoil. So I feel like that, to me, would have been enough. And as you were saying, if we excise the conflict between the friends, we probably would have had a much tighter movie that would have mm-hmm. worked better, even if it was a little bit short. Because this right. does clock in at like an hour and 34 minutes. So even if it was like an hour and 20 minutes, it would have mm-hmm. been tight. And I think it would have the movie would have benefited. I completely agree. And I agree with you about, yes, it's an absolutely a trope to save, you know, the, the, the dying camp, but I special, I think it's especially potent at a time when, and this has been happening for a long time. This is not new, but especially at a time when, when the arts are so denigrated and theater is considered superfluous and the arts in school are considered mm-hmm. superfluous. And especially Right now, at this moment in time, when WGA and SAG are on strike because they're not getting paid, you know, enough. And again, like, it's just we don't as a society collectively, we don't value art and artists enough. And so I think while, yes, it is absolutely a trope, I think it's a really salient one here. It's really important, you know, to value Art. And I think that's why it's so, in part, that's why it's so great that Troy realizes how special the camp is and really, you know, does a complete 180 and wants to save the camp and wants to help the camp. Because he sees yeah, what I, a safe haven it is for the kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. It, it did turn out to take on even a little bit more significance with the strikes going on and Right. Even the commentary about how Patty Harrison, you know, her character is from the venture capital world and the venture capital has bought up the other camp. And yeah. we have that right now in Hollywood. We have these businessmen that come in and, you know, throw their weight around and really don't give a shit about the art and the artists. They're only giving a shit about how many more gajillion dollars they can make. And it's just gross, you know seeing you know bob Iger's fucking interview where he was just calling their demands unrealistic and things like the uh from his fucking ivory tower up there <laughs> i'm sh- i was realizing nobody can see me i'm shaking my head in disgust <laughs> yeah. yeah i'm realizing it's, it's only gross. you can see me evan <laughs> right and that that piece i forget which publication it ran in where you know this the studio executives were showing their true colors and saying our goal yes. is to run this out until we can starve people and kick them out of their homes and then they'll bow to our wishes like that's fucked up dude that's fucked up how much more many how many more millions do you need to make like 
It's never enough. It's ridiculous. It's never enough. That's the problem. That's the problem with these executives, these billionaires, is that it's never enough. Nothing. No right. amount. They like, just want to bleed people dry. There's no amount. It's absurd mm-hmm. and gross. And, you know, the, the whole Bob Iger thing really pisses me off. On a side note, just because like, you know, he just came back and people were so annoyed with what's his face and he came in. Yes. And because he was so wishy-washy on queer rights and Bob Iger was like, no, queer rights are important. Like he was like he was welcomed back from a lot of people on the outside who, you know, like Disney and follow Disney news and I don't want to be like, all he had to do was keep his mouth shut, but I'm like, all he had to do is keep his mouth shut. And like, no, yeah. now he's like a complete villain and he's disgusting. Although I, you know what? I'm glad he didn't keep his mouth shut because now we know he's a dirt bag. So now we know, you know what he mm-hmm. really thinks, which is gross, but totally. Yeah. 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 Fran Drescher said something really funny and like a statement about that. Like if I were a Disney, I would keep him under, I would keep him locked away and not let him talk anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy. Yeah, it's a mess. It's an absolute mess. But Yep. It is a mess, but you know, obviously you know where we stand, listeners. We support the writers, we support the actors that are striking right now. Absolutely. They deserve fair treatment, fair pay. And uh, you know, maybe Bob Iger can make five million dollars less a year if it means, you know, <laughs> helping people fucking earn a living wage and not you know, be, you know, struggling to make ends meet. I mean, I've been seeing all these, you know, screenshots of actors posting their paltry residuals that they make from the things that they do. And it's just ridiculous Mm -hmm. the amount of work they put in and what little they get out of it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, You know, I've seen, yeah, I've seen writer and actor after actor after writer posting about how they used to be able to work full time. They, you know, and now they can't just because of the way things are structured based on streaming and residuals and how the system has changed. And yeah, it's very sad. And hopefully they get what they deserve. Yeah. Yep. Hopefully. Yeah. And hopefully the execs get what they deserve. I know, which is another way. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> different way i know anyway. <laughs> i want to i want a success story it's reminding me of here in massachusetts when market basket went on strike do you remember that megan mm, the people of market basket yes, who I worked do. there were like there's a local grocery store chain for any you know listeners uh in, in new england massachusetts new hampshire i don't know if they are, operate elsewhere but basically the workers were pissed because they you know one of the the ceo that was great the tree the workers great got ousted by another person in the family business and the workers went on strike and they brought the company to its knees until they reinstalled the (laughs) the right ceo and they got the things that they wanted and it was it was impressive it was really amazing what they did with this strike because the grocery stores you know, we're, we're closed. Like the truckers weren't delivering the shipments. They were also like helping with the strike and it really, it was effective. It shows what you can do when you band together and everybody gets on the same page. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I want to see more of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, unions are important, you know, unions are important. People banding together, you know, for collective bargaining, that's important. All of that. I completely agree. Um, I think for me, the only thing is that I wish was different is not just a success story, but I'm very anti-capitalism. And so I wish the whole system was abolished, but that's, that is, <laughs> that is uh down the road and another conversation for another time. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I'm very, I'm very excited to see not only the writer striking, but the, but actors striking too. And you know, the producers guild also supporting the strike and which is really nice to see. So Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It's really important. And it's also nice to see some directors come out, you know, in support of the strike too, um, which is as they should. So, but yes, but let's, let's bring it back. (laughs) We did, but I, you know, we did, but we didn't because it was relevant. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) because this is a movie you know actually both movies that we discussed this week i think interestingly are about capitalism and so i think it's important to talk about this because 
nothing exists in a vacuum. So, you know, all art is political and it's important to talk about that. And it's important to talk about the current events and the context. So I actually, as much as it does feel like a tangent, I actually think it's a, it was an important aside. So, but let's, let's uh, zoom back or zoom back (laughs) in, not zoom out, (laughs) zoom in and, and, and bring this in for a landing and all that. So Barbie is in theaters right now. I would a hundred thousand million percent say go see it. It is stunning. It is stunning to watch and it is a lot of fun and also very introspective and I loved it. So yes, highly recommend. And Theater Camp, I think it's safe to say, Evan, you would recommend it. I would. Yeah. I would say it's not everybody's cup of tea. I feel Mm -hmm. like you have to be appreciative of theater and theater like of theater musical theater and kind of like meta mockumentary style movies to really be into this one but i think if you do you'll be very happy with the result yeah i will say something i didn't say when we were talking about it before that i did appreciate is when they're doing kind of like the kids are doing like this witch's spell and they're talking about audra mcdonald and adina menzel and i was like dying that was funny to me (laughs) because i'm like Cause I just, I love like Broadway shows and hearing them talk about Broadway singers. It was great. But yeah, my, I think your, my, your mileage may vary on this for me. I wasn't as enamored with it as I said, but I still would recommend it. Like, I still think it's a good film. I still think it's worth watching. I just didn't love it as much as everybody else, but yeah, I still think it's, it's definitely worth watching. So I would also, and it is playing in theaters now. So We want to give a huge thank you to our editor, Otto Clammer. Otto, thank you so much for making us sound so great week after week. You're awesome. Yeah, thanks, Otto. You can find Spoiler Peace Theater anywhere you get podcasts. We are at every podcast platform. You can also find us at spoilerpeace.com. And you can follow us on social media. We're all over the place. We're at Spoiler Peace on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Letterboxd. even TikTok, even though we don't post, but we need to post. And who knows? Maybe we'll get on threads too. We're we're going to be everywhere. So, yeah, but come come follow us. Come say hello on our social media profiles. Uh, if you want to reach out to us, you can email us at spoilerpiece spoilerpiece at gmail dot com, or you can give us a call at eight six two two one piece and leave us a voicemail message. Text us. Let us know that you too loved Barbie, or maybe I oversold it. I did not, (laughs) you know, or you were a theater kid or maybe you were not a theater kid, but you appreciated, you know, the summer camp experience. But yeah, we love hearing your comments, your questions, your thoughts on film. So definitely reach out to us and we'd love to hear from you. And speaking of hearing from you, you can also make your voice heard by rating our podcast. That really helps us get the word out about the show and lets other people discover it. So you can go to ratethispodcast.com slash spoiler piece. That will take you to your preferred platform of choice to rate us. Or you can just go directly to our Apple podcast page. That helps us out a lot. You can also rate us on Spotify. Um, if you really, really like the show, consider joining our Patreon for $5 a month. You get access to bonus episodes each week. This week, we fulfilled a patron's request and talked about the 1982 fantasy film, Conan the Barbarian. Um, You also get access to all of our bonus episodes, hundreds of them. And you also get to vote in monthly polls, which is always a lot of fun. And yeah, if you are a patron already, thank you. And if you are not, consider joining. And have I got, did I forget anything? I think you got it. I think you got everything. Yay me. All right. Oh, also go to our website at spoilerpiece.com and you can check out our merch that will take a take you to our tea public page where you can get t-shirts, hoodies, pillows, tote bags, a whole host of things. Our logo is really awesome and vibrant and colorful and all mm-hmm. of the merch is really fantastic. So go check it out. And yeah, now I think that's it. My name is Megan Kearns. I write film reviews for Edge Media Network. I'm a member of the Boston Online Film Critics Association, and I'm a member of Gallica. You can follow me on Twitter at OpinionSWorld or on Instagram and Letterboxd at the Opinion S. My name is Evan Crean. I am co-chair of the Boston Online Film Critics Association and co-author of your 80s movie guide to better living. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Letterboxd, and now threads as Real Recon, and that's real as in film reel. 
Ooh, you're on the threads now too. Fancy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And we will see you next time. Bye.